well, good morning. Good morning to the beautiful people of the Presbyterian Church of Livonia. It's with great gladness that I that I invite you to my home on this case. This is uh, my my library. Uh, most of the books are actually here. Some books over there. This is where I studied when I first came to this house. This was my first study room. Then I moved to the one beside here, behind this, this wall. Then I went upstairs. Currently I am upstairs, but the books are always down here. I have a small selection upstairs only. Um, this is the setting that I have chosen for us to, to do our lectures. Um, I think, I think, you tell me later what you think, that this is a little bit of an improvement over the plain white wall that we had for the video of our previous Bible study. Okay, today, uh, as I told you before, we are going to do half of the time. We're going to dedicate half of our time or as much as as, as needed up to half of our time. And the other half, we're going to continue from where we stopped. So uh, we are on question number 45. I'm sure you guys remember that. Uh, I have here, you guys should still have this PDF, which is a question 45, it's a PDF with three pages. So we have the question and the, the question on top, the answer, and then all the rest of this page and the other pages are only the, the, the biblical references and the Bible verses that you're going to be looking at. So before you go any further, let us, let us, let us pray. Let us pray and ask the Lord for his blessing. We've got a lot of exciting stuff to look at uh, today. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, almighty God. You're wonderful. You're kind. You are so, so glorious and so gentle to us. Oh Lord, we, we thank you for your gentleness in allowing us to study together, even though my brothers and sisters are far away from me and I'm, I'm far away from them now. Oh Lord, we pray that you may guide us through this study, that we may study your word well, that the people listening may be thoroughly blessed, that I may be thoroughly blessed, so that we may be more Christ-like, more godly, and that we may be more full of passion. Bless us, O oh Lord. Bless us as we look today into the, the kingdom, the king of the kingdom, and the aspects of this kingdom. Bless us, O oh Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, let us begin. Let us begin. Let us begin with the questions that we have received. Um, note on that. I have received a few questions indeed, and um, we can, we're can we going to go through them quickly. Some of these questions will take a long time, more than usual, will be not just five or, ten min, five or ten seconds to answer. It's not a one answer, one word answer. Uh, so some of them will, will go for a long, for a longer period. Some questions may be answered in two minutes, one minute, some in ten even. Uh, but a note on that. Not everybody sent me questions. Uh, you don't need to have questions, of course, obviously. Uh, but I'm not, don't, don't need to flatter me by saying, oh, Felipe, you explained it so well. We, we have no questions, okay? I know myself, I know myself. Um, but if you don't have any questions, just send a note. Felipe, I do not have any questions for today. If you do, do send the questions themselves. I did not get that many replies. That's why I'm, I'm making this comment. And I hope that next time uh, it will be a bit different. This is the first time we're doing this. So there is room. Let, let us be, let us give ample room for, for, for improvement. So let us look at the first question that we have. Uh, I'm not going to be mentioning who, who are making the questions or, or so forth. Um, I'm just going to give, give you guys the questions. Uh, one question that we got here, at what point does Christ actually become king? In the conception, in the womb, birth, after resurrection. Now, if Ted Cress 
would be getting this question, he would be answering like this. Yes. I remember he answered one, a similar question to that in a previous Bible study. And the question is, and the answer is, yes, all of it. Christ was always king. He was king, is king, will always be king. The reason for that is that the kingdom is an eternal kingdom. There always was a kingdom. There always is a kingdom. There always will be a kingdom. And there is no such thing as a kingdom without a king. It's contrary to, to, to reason, contrary to logic even. So uh, a, a kingless kingdom doesn't really work. So Christ was always a king. The second person of the Trinity took flesh, came to this world, was born, and he came bringing the kingdom on a fuller sense. I'll explain this a bit later. Uh, a better explanation to this question will be coming on the, on the answer to the, come, the question after this one. So when Christ came, he came bringing the kingdom because he's the king himself. But the king was already present in a certain sense, in a certain aspect that will be seen in a few minutes. So Christ was always the king. At the pre-incarnation appearances of Christ in the Old Testament, of course, uh, he, was all, he was already king. He was already accepting worship. He was already re revealing himself as God. And, and th that's why we can confidently say that the, king, the kingdom was already, to a certain extent, present. And that's why we can also affirm that he was always the king. Oh, by the way, one side note here. If you are actually wondering why I have these white things on my ear, it's not that somebody's... I'm not listening to music as I'm doing the Bible study. It's I'm using this for the purposes of getting a great audio. Uh, it's quite close to my lips, of course. So I suppose you guys at home will be able to hear me very well. So once again, I'm not listening to music. I'm 100% focused on the Bible study. Um... The following, the follow-up question of the same from the same person. He always was and will be king. Yes, indeed, he always was and always will be king. We'll be looking at that uh, at more Bible verses that prove this in a few minutes. Uh, but just for now, let us let us remember the Lord's prayer. On the end, on the end of the Lord's prayer, which you can find in Matthew chapter six, the prayer ends like this: For yours is the kingdom. And the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, His is the kingdom. Now, of course, the, the, the Lord's prayer is directed to the Father. Our Father, which art in heaven. But on the end of the Lord's prayer, we see, Yours is the kingdom. So, does the kingdom belong to God the Father? Does the kingdom belong to God the Son? Or does the kingdom belong to God the the Holy Spirit. Well, in the book of Revelation, we have, I want to, I want to take you guys there. We see, we see that Christ appears, will appear, uh, but he appeared to John. John saw how Christ would look like in the future when, on his second coming. And the description is one of, of wonderful, of phenomenal glory. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So is, so is the kingdom belonging to God the Father or God the Son? Or is it God the Holy Spirit? The Bible says that God the Holy Spirit is God. We people are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So is the king of the kingdom dividing his glory? Of course not. Of course not. So the kingdom belongs to the Godhead. They are the above, the ones who are above everything. The, the Godhead, the Trinity rules. I've mentioned this before on our Bible study. The external works of God are indivisible. What you see, the decrees and, and the actions in the spiritual actions, in the spiritual decrees that you see God the Father making, you can say the same for God the Son, and you can say the same for God the Holy Spirit. Another Bible verse, Psalm 145, verses 12 to verse 13. And by the way, all the verses that I'm reading, of course, are coming from the New King James Version. 
and let me actually take a moment to recommend the book here I'm going to recommend these three books but this one of here is just a Bible uh, wow wonderful I'm recommending a Bible wow great but the, the interesting thing about this New King James Version here is that it is not it is not divided into verses and neither into chapters you can actually find the chapter because there is a discrete number on the corner but the text the text flows as if there would be no bible verses um, the bible verses are a blessing for us to find where uh, where on the look on the text to the, the reference that we desire is actually located so the division into chapters and verses are very helpful very helpful i don't want to downplay that but when it comes to the printed page remember i'm talking about the printed page the printed page only when it comes to the printed page it's not helpful because when these documents were originally originally written there was no such thing as chapter and verse so the person writing it the, the inspired author thought he envisioned the person reading as he wrote of course obviously who who doesn't do it like that who 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 writes a text and imagines that the one reading will read a, a different text and not only the, the content but the, the the visibility of it of course of course this was done in a time where there was no editing if you wrote it you wrote it that's it so there was no um uh, you could not press delete and type it again it, it was quite different so i highly recommend the, this bible look at this for example you see so the text is quite complete it's quite a quite a a pleasant quite a quite a pleasant way of reading the bible so let us continue uh psalm 145 verse 12 and 13 to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glory and the glorious majesty of his kingdom your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations if there is a kingdom by default there is a king if the kingdom is everlasting then the king is everlasting and you can say the same on the reverse order if the king is everlasting the kingdom is everlasting if there always was a king there always was a kingdom one doesn't exist without the other um now continuing here this this one, I think I, I, I want to break my, my protocol and I actually want to mention. Uh, our dear beloved brother David Freer sent me a very, very interesting article. On the previous Bible study, I mentioned that I have no idea how, I had no idea how the, the wise men went, to, went searching for Jesus in, uh, in Jerusalem. Eventually, they went to Bethlehem. Which is where David himself was born, and which is where the the prophecy, the prophecies of the Old Testament pointed to be the place of the birth of the Messiah, of the Christ. So I mentioned that I I had no idea how can a star or how can a, a, an event in the skies have some kind of direction for people on Earth. Um, and once again, I said that I did not. On the previous Bible study, that I did not want to to look into to, to try to explain this, but this this quite interesting article here um, pro brings some interesting points. And the title is "Can Astronomy Explain the Bib the Biblical Star of Bethlehem?" Quite an interesting read. Uh, I recommend it. Highly recommend it. As a side note, this is not a theology. This uh, this article doesn't really bring theological content, which I'm happy about, which I'm happy about. Uh, it just brings a perspective of what could be an explanation for, for the biblical description. Quite interesting. So uh, please take a look if you need, if you can find it, just like, just with the, the title, please go ahead and find it online. If you don't, if you hit a wall, uh, email me and I will send you the link to this article. So continuing, the next question is, in question 45, which is, of course, the one that we're dealing with right now, 
we agree that there are three parts to consider. Yes, we do agree. The first part states that Jesus governs the visible church through his officers. The second part, it explains how King Jesus exercises authority over the invisible church. The third section tells how he deals with, with the unbelievers. In the Gospels, we see references to the kingdom of heaven and to the kingdom of God. Correct. Both, uh, both expressions are found in the Bible. Sometimes in even kingdom of Christ, uh, everlasting kingdom, and, and so on. So indeed, we, so far, I mean, so far there are no questions. Uh, indeed, the, as we saw before, the answer is divided into three parts. The invisible church, the visible church, and the rest of the world, which of course contains... Uh, visibly contains those who are professedly known to be unbelievers. Um, in the Gospels, we see references to the kingdom of heaven and to the kingdom of God. Jesus refers to those of kingdom of heaven as those who are in the visible church. Oops, something happened here. No, not bad. Um, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 30, the parable of the talents. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling. When a man traveling to a far country, quote unquote, returns, he will reward the good and faithful servants and judge the wicked and lazy servants. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he says, you must be born again. Indeed, that's a conversation he had with Nicodemus on John chapter 3. Uh, thus, he is indicating the invisible church. Uh, most, assured, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered most assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water in the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's just a side note on this verse. There are debates if the word that is properly actually a camel or camelos. I believe the Greek word that is camelos. It's a long time that I researched this, but I believe the Greek word is camelos. And uh, actually, it's one of those thick, thick ropes used to tie ships up. Uh, so I think it, if the translation is actually referring to that kind of uh, rope, uh, it, would be, it would make the comparison more logical. I have a needle, a thicker rope than actually a large animal like a camel. But regardless of what the translation is, the theology, it's pretty settled. So it's referring to the difficulties of those who are in love with money instead of being in love with God. Which, by the way, applies for poor and rich alike. Middle class, if you are middle class, if you are lower class, if you are upper class, that applies to all. If it's very difficult for those to enter the kingdom of God if they do not love, if they love money above God. And side note number two. Observe how interesting is this language. It is difficult to enter the kingdom of God. We have to interpret this properly. Let me give you the technical, straightforward, theological comment on this. It is impossible for anyone to enter the kingdom of God by their own efforts. Anyone that ever enters the kingdom of God enters because God made it so. Not because they have achieved A, B, or C. So technically speaking, it's impossible for anyone that ever existed to enter the kingdom of God. It's only made possible to some by the power and the work of Christ with the, if, if, with the giving of grace by, from the Holy Spirit. So now finally we come to the actual question. We always wondered if there is a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Are we on the right track? Can you explain it further? Are we missing something? Yes, I can explain it further. You are on the right track. And I'm not sure if you're missing anything, but I'm sure I can make comments. First thing, um, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of Christ are different expressions that are talking about the same thing. Six, half a dozen. If I hit you on your head or if I hit you in between your ears, <laughs> it's, it's the same deal. Um, uh, uh, let, let's, do a, let's compare a few Bible verses. For example, Luke chapter 18, verse 24 and 25. 
And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, How hard it is for those who have, who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So twice, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. Now, the expression kingdom of God, kingdom of, of, uh, of Christ, these expressions appear multiple times on the New Testament. I think kingdom of God appears like 62 times or something. And kingdom of Christ over 20 or the opposite or vice versa. So it, it's, a, it's a commonly repeated expression. Um, now look at Matthew. Then Jesus said to his disciples, same passage, same, not, not the same passage, different books, of course, but the same actual situation is being described. Um, they're narrating the same events, rather. I want to say it like that. So Matthew narrating the same event that Luke recorded. He used a different expression. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, on Luke, we saw the kingdom of God. So which one is it? Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Which one is it? Is there any difference? No. They are referring to the same moment. And yet, they both chose to record using different words. A possibility for that is that Matthew, uh, writing particularly to a Jewish audience, once again, remember, the book of Matthew was written mostly with the Jews in mind. The book of Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark was written mostly with the Romans in mind. The book of Luke was written mostly to the Greeks in mind. The book of John is the, what we call the universal gospel. So, uh, written with all nations in mind. Which I think is, that's why, that's my favorite gospel. However, Matthew is writing to a particularly Jewish audience. So it is expected, it is reasonable, it is understandable that you would be a bit more reticent to use the expression kingdom of God. Why? Because the Jews themselves uh, were always careful, way too careful in my opinion, when it came to using the name of, of God. By the way, God is not even a name, God is a title. Uh, until today, many Jews write G and then apostrophe D because they're, they're not writing the name of God uh, well on the other hand Matthew actually two times I believe he used the expression kingdom of God so even with his possible reticence his concern with, with using it he even ended up using it uh, I understand this the reasons for that, it may be likely that he actually wanted to say, we are acknowledging without any fear that this man Christ is the king of the kingdom of God. This man Jesus is the king of the kingdom of God himself. So what is the kingdom? Now, that's a very big answer. That's a very long answer. Uh, I'll try to do my best here. Uh, I think I can, I can summarize, but... When I say long, the answer is quite long. If you want to go to the details of it, wow, yeah, it's going to take a few classes. There are books and books and books that are written on this topic. Ger uh, Gerhard von Groningen wrote three thick books, this this, this thick, uh, in which he, dis he talks a lot about the covenant, the king, which is the mediator of the covenant as well, and the kingdom, and he he shows a, a golden a golden line. I, I don't remember the English expression for it. Uh, in Portuguese, it would be like a golden line, the, the 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 golden line that goes from the book of Genesis all the way through the entire Bible, all the way to the to the to the book of Revelation. So the the kingdom of God is a is a theme that is found throughout the whole Bible particularly the New Testament. You cannot see a book in the New Testament that sets aside, totally sets aside the the concept of kingdom or, or the notion of kingdom or speaks without being mindful of the kingdom. Now, what is this kingdom? There are, there are a few um, 
definitions. Von Groningen has an excellent one. An excellent one. I did not find it in English. I, I'm quoting from memory from eight years ago when I studied this for the first time. He, he defines the kingdom of God as the realm of ruling of the exalted Christ. The, the realm it may be a physical, it may be spiritual, maybe both. Uh, the definition doesn't the definition alone doesn't go into that, but his point is the, the place or the location, whether physical or not physical, in which the exalted Christ rules. A more simple explanation given by the Erdman's Bible Dictionary is that realm ruled by God. Another longer one uh, given by another dictionary, the Dictionary of Bible Themes, um, gives the following. This, this is by Martin Menser, or less frequently, kingdom of heaven, the kingly rule of God in the lives of people and nations. It refers to the recognition of the authority of God rather than a definite geographical area and begins with the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's quite helpful. Um, once again, he mentioned that it begins with the ministry of Jesus Christ. It, it states like this because, once again, the king came. The coming of Christ is the coming of the of the, the king. The kingdom was already in place in a certain extent. In a certain extent. Once again, I read to you guys Psalm 145, Old Testament. And they are saying his kingdom is everlasting. And it's not referring to the kingdom of David. They perfectly knew that David would die. They were speaking about the kingdom of the God. Now, the let us let, let us uh, deal more with this matter. Are we, are we right now, are we in the kingdom of heaven? Now, th there's much to, to talk about this. I'll begin with Second Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting, everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. Look at this. If you do these things, meaning the living a godly life, which is lived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the ones who have the Holy Spirit are the people that are already converted in the first place. So this is not an entrance by effort. This is an entrance by thankfulness of the work that Christ already did in you, which will be a natural consequence. Natural. It will naturally happen. So by living like by living in such manner, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when you read this verse, you think, okay, so the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is a kingdom that will, that will be found only in the afterlife. The new heaven and the new, earth, and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the new city of our Lord. When you read this, if that's all we had in the Bible, we could confidently say that the kingdom of God is a kingdom that is to come. Now, take a look at these other passages. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So which one is it? The kingdom is here? Is the kingdom coming? The kingdom already came and I missed it? Which one is it? Another one, Luke chapter uh, 19. Now, as they heard these things, the disciples, he spoke, Jesus spoke, another parable. Because he, were near, he was near Jerusalem and because they, the disciples, thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Look at that. Luke chapter 19, verse 11. So, there comes John the Baptist saying, Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And now comes Jesus and tells a parable. Because his disciples were thinking that the kingdom of God was arriving immediately. Which one is it? And the answer is yes, it's both. In one sense, the kingdom of God is present here. Now let me explain how was the kingdom present in the Old Testament. The kingdom was present in the Old Testament through its through its leaders. If you take, for example, um, Adam, 
He was the he was the king of the earth. He was ruling by God's appointing. God appointed him as a co-regent of his kingdom. The Bible, the, the whole universe always belonged to God. He made it. He made it. The psalm says that God owns the entire universe, the whole world, and the people that live in the world. So it was always God who ruled the kingdom. But God signed Adam to be his co-regent. And he even told him, Adam, work in the garden. Exercise the garden. Do, do it. Work it in such a way. Exercise it in such a way that you'll be even more productive. So co-regent. This whatever decision Adam made in the in the, would have done in the garden. Let's say uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna shape this location like this. On that area I'm gonna build such. On that other area I'm gonna do another such. Those decisions would stand. They would stand. He was a co-regent. Now after that we have Noah, another regent. His word was rule for the entire world. Another one. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the patriarchs of God's people. What, what I mean by God's people, I mean this, the chosen nation of Israel. I'm not saying that every Jew is a chosen person. No, there, are, there were Jews that hated God to the bone. So uh, they, they were the, the, the patriarchs, the, the ones through which God promised that the kingdom would come. Uh, that the kingdom, a, a certain kingdom on earth would be formed. A nation would be formed. Interesting that initially he did not even want a king. He wanted a nation. He wanted to be the immediate king of his kingdom. But by people's um, sinful desire, he eventually actually gave them a king. But nevertheless, uh, we see that the a certain kingdom was formed and David David was the king par uh, not par excellence but the king that God himself said this king rules according to my own heart he is a man according to my own heart so we see a kingdom forming we see a realm forming on earth in which God ruled through King David through Moses by the giving of the laws Moses was also you can say a, a, a ruler of his people through Moses, the, the nation was shaped, formed, was given codified laws, written laws, written uh, instructions to his people. So a certain kingdom was formed on earth. And how would people hear of God at that time? They would come and hear about the king in the kingdom of that king. He, they would come to Israel and hear of the great deeds of the great God. So there was this kind of kingdom. But the re like I said... Um, Jesus is the real and everlasting king. God is the real and everlasting king of his kingdom. So when Christ came, the kingdom came. In its, not yet in its absolute fullness, but in a much, in a much greater sense than what it was already present. So that's why the definition that we read a few minutes ago mentions that this kingdom came with the coming of the king. Once again, you cannot have a king without a kingdom or a kingdom without a king. So with his coming, and that's why John the Baptist said, the kingdom, repent the kingdoms at hand. Why? The, the king arrived. If the king is with us, the kingdom is with us. So the kingdom is the place where God rules. Now, where is where, where, where is this this location? Luke chapter seventeen verse twenty twenty one. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, "The kingdom of God does not come with observation." Ah, that's quite interesting. See, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Nor will they say, "See here" or "See there." For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now we have what we would call the, king, the visible kingdom today. The visible kingdom today would be the church. There are parables, uh, for example, the parable of wheat and tares, that show that in the location worked by the king, which is the the one sowing this, the one who is doing the who is in charge of the agriculture of the location on the parable. Um, Within his field, which is his kingdom, there were wheat and tares. He didn't throw the tares. Evils, enemies, 
threw in the tears. They, they, they threw bad seeds. Uh, by the way, until today, uh, I'll, I'll cite one, one, one example, India, for example. It's a kind of revenge, a horrible one, a terrible one, to go and throw bad seeds into the, into the, into the, the field of, a, of an enemy. There is even a regulation for that, forbidding that, and stating the penalty for the people that do that. So, um, so the king on that location, that kingdom, contains the good and the bad. So on that sense, there is, there is a certain visibility, a certain visibility to it, but the kingdom that best reflects the reality of it, um, the, the spiritual reality is, of course, the spiritual kingdom. It sounds redundant what I'm saying, but please bear with me. The, the, the invisible kingdom is the kingdom in which Christ truly rules, not that he, his hands are tied on the other kingdom, but on this, hand, on this kingdom, on the spiritual kingdom, his will is being made, is being accomplished, is seen. So the kingdom of God is, is God's ruling in our hearts in such a way that affects our deeds. So he's saying here, the kingdom is not something that you can point out and say, oh, look, see, there, that is the kingdom. No. I'll tell you more. Wherever a Christian goes, wherever a Christian goes, there goes the glory of God. For the Christian carries that God in his heart. So if you want to take the glory of God to all the corners of the earth, send Christians, send missionaries to all the corners of the earth. So the whole world will have the glory of God. The whole earth will be filled with his kingdom. Romans chapter 14 verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now look at this expression. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Who has that? Who has righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? The answer is, oh, the Christian. Who else? The truly born again. I'm not talking about just the one that woke up one day and said, you know what, now I'm a Christian. Not, not, not that. The, the, the lips can say anything. Oh, I am a, a dinosaur. There you go. So you see, those who are truly converted have the kingdom of God in them. So the kingdom came with the coming of the king, a kingdom that is invisible in its nature. There is some aspects that are considered visible. For example, the gathering of God's people under the preaching of the word, the proper administration of the sacraments, and the proper implementation of church discipline. However, the kingdom, the true, true, true kingdom, is where Christ is ruling and his will is being implemented, is being done. So when a, when a Christian sins, and we all do so, there is a diff, there's a big difference between punctual sins and a life that is sinful. Those are two very different things. This category here, a life that is sinful, that doesn't exist in the life of a true Christian. Now, the punctual sins, the, the one-off, the, those that, I mean, you can, I'm not saying that if you sinned, if you broke the, the seventh commandment once, you never break it again, or the ninth, or the second, or the third, or whichever. But I'm saying that it is something that happens in a moment. And then another moment, another moment, at a, as far away as possible at least, will happen again. That the Christians go through that. I go through that. You go through that. If you are a Christian, of course. But if you're not a Christian, then, then the life is sinful. It, it's the living in sin that we're referring here um, and my last comment on the the kingdom of christ and the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of god which is all the same um i would recommend that you read and i know we're going we're going ahead here but to go to the question 191 of the larger catechism of westminster the larger catechism of westminster on the question 191 speaks about uh, and many other questions there they, they go through all the, 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 the sentences of the Lord's Prayer. They explain why we, we deal with, we say our Father, we say which art in heaven. They deal with, with all, all the lines, line by line of the entire Lord's Prayer. Question 191 speaks to the second petition found in the Lord's Prayer. And the section, second petition is thy kingdom come. So what is it meant? 
When you and I pray, Our Father the church in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. What are we asking? And according to the answer of the theologians of Westminster, the answer is, uh, we, in, by in saying so, we are acknowledging ourselves and all mankind to be by nature under the dominion of sin and Satan. So it's a petition, may your kingdom come, meaning it is not fully yet here. Yes, indeed, the kingdom came, but the, the king came, but is it totally here yet? Of course not. Is Jesus right now on earth physically? No, otherwise we'd be able to see him. But there'll be a day in which Jesus will be 100% on earth, ruling on the new Jerusalem, which will be here. Here will be the new heavens and the new earth. This location that we have, that we we are walking right now, whole creation, the whole creation will be renewed. It will be perfect. It will be paradise on earth. Actually, better yet, earth will be paradise. So we acknowledge on this petition that we are still under the dominion of Satan and under the dominion of sin. What does it mean? That sin is still takes place. That Satan is still messing up our world, and that we sometimes are his partners when we sin. Continuing, we pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed, the gospel propagated throughout the world, the Jews called, the fullness of the Gentiles brought in, the church furnished with all gospel officers and ordinances. See, the, 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 this is the growing of the kingdom. More churches, more, or, more elders, more pastors preaching, more uh, missions, more people coming to Christ, more people bound to Christ. That's the expansion of the kingdom. So once again, you cannot expand what's not yet here. But is it yet here fully? No. Guys, you guys are getting the idea. I'm sure you're getting the idea that when we speak about the kingdom of God, we got to look at the theology of we call the theology of right now, but not yet. Am I a Christian? Yes, right now. But not fully yet. I'm not a perfect Christian. I'm still sinning. Am I saved? Yes. But not right now. Not fully. Am I saved now? Yes. Am I fully saved? Of course not. I'm still sinning. I'm still living in a world that is quite broken. Is, am I hugging Jesus right now? Well, I wish, but I'm not. I'm not. So until those things come into reality, the kingdom is not fully yet here, but already arrived. Right now. But not yet. So we continue. Um, that the church may be purged from corruption, countenanced and maintained by the civil magistrate, that the ordinances of Christ may be purely dispensed and made effectual to the converting of those that are yet in their sins. And the confirming, comforting, and building up of those that are already converted. See, the, 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 further, the further growth or in holiness of those that are already in the kingdom. Those that are in the visible kingdom, that they may be growing in the invisib inv invisibility of their own, uh, of Christ's kingdom in them. That Christ would rule in our hearts here and hasten the time of his second coming and our reigning with him forever. And that he would be pleased so to exercise the kingdom of his power in all the world and may best conduce to these ends. Oh, well, I have gone 40 minutes on answering the questions. Now, that's okay because answering these questions will make the actual study of the question 45 quite easy. Before I get there, I want to recommend two uh, documents. First one of them is this one here. It's called Authentic Christianity. I'm sure you guys can read by Moorcraft. It's a, it's a, see this one is volume two. Volume one, three, four, so one, two, three, four, five. Uh, this is an exposition of the theology and ethics of the Westminster Larger Catechism. Good stuff in here, pure, gold but you may be thinking Philippe if I want a study but not that in depth this is this very in depth that's quite profound I mean one cannot write all of this and, and just go on the surface unless it's a very poorly quite poorly gifted writer 
Um, I also have this one here for those who love Portuguese. This is a translation. Uh, they actually the original is in English. It's the commentary on the Western on the Westminster Larger Catechism by by this great man here, Johannes Gerhardus Voss. This is my Portuguese translation. Uh, I brought from Brazil with me. I, lo I love this book, and I use it when I'm preparing these Bible studies. Uh, but you can buy them in, in English. You can buy not them. Sorry, you can buy this one. This one is already in English. You can buy this one in English. This is the, it was originally, of course, uh, written in English, so you can find online. It's not expensive. The the five volumes, well, they, they're not that cheap. Let me put it this way. <laughs> Uh, so let us continue from where we, we stopped. We are here on the reference number 107, let me check here, uh, 177. I mentioned that I don't want to talk about church discipline now, I want to talk about church discipline when we are together, because I want the discussion to be made live. So I'm going to skip that part, and I will get back to it whenever we get together. So we see here that Christ executes the office of a king. So how does he execute? He executes the office of a king in cutting out of the world the people to himself, the visible church, of course, and giving them officers, laws, and sanctions by which he visibly governs them. I'll skip this one, like I said before. Let us go straight into the invisible church. In bestowing saving grace upon his elect, Reference 178. Let us look at it. Please go there to reference 178. That is the, the reference of the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 31. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So we see here an invisible manner. Of governing the Church of Christ. Excuse me, my, my throat is a bit dry now. So, an invisible way to govern his church by giving grace to his church. The exalted Christ is the one that grants Israel forgiveness, forgiveness of sins, and repentance on their hearts. So, Christ is invisibly ruling his church can we say can we say i see with my eyes grace no grace is an abstract you can see somebody coming to somebody else and saying and telling a story i i was lost but now i'm saved that's a story that you can see it may be the case it may be not be the case but grace itself you cannot see forgiveness of sins can one say, I saw forgiveness of sins? No, those are abstracts. They, they do not exist in a, in, a, in a physical, in a concrete manner. Now, they are truly real. In fact, the abstracts of the kingdom of God are way more powerful than anything that we can see that is concrete. So let us continue. So, in this story, saving grace upon his elect, rewarding their obedience that's the next uh, biblical reference how does so christ rules the invisible church by rewarding their obedience uh, revelation chapter 22 verse 12 and behold i am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work um, we, we see here of course that obedience uh, will increase the obedience, will increase, will result in an increased uh, reward. Salvation is not by works. However, there is some element of, cry, of Christ's reward to his people in obedience that is measured and is given and it's rewarded by the amount of work that the person exercised in his Christian life. That's not salvation. Salvation is a God, an act done by God in a sovereign manner. We're talking about here sanctification, which of course Christ, God is involved. Without God, there's no such thing as sanctification. Um, but the man, as per the instruction of the Apostle Paul, 
uh, one should subjugate his own will and bring it into submission to the will of Christ. Now, how do you do this? By trusting God that you will do it, by focusing on your thankfulness to what he has already done. But there is an element of personal action in this matter. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Uh, sounds like, like he was playing with us, right? You're about to go to prison. Some of you are about to go to prison, but relax. <laughs> the, the, the values of the kingdom of God are so different than anything else we know, isn't it? The, how can the apostle say this with a straight face? Some of you will die, but relax. <laughs> now comes Peter. Comes Peter late. Before this, before this came Peter saying, your our brief momentary a light tribulation now peter himself had been beaten had suffered he suffered like ooh, imprisoned beaten not given a trial beaten again imprisoned again crucified upside down as per the tradition of the church which i believe is the case and he says um, Will be, the, the tribulation will be light, <laughs> momentary, and uh, be quite easy. But why? Why? How can he say that with a straight face? How can that not be a lie? Well, because of the rest of the statement. Because it will give unto you an eternal, eternal weight of glory. You'll be rewarded with fantastic benefits. Not, not the glory of God in a sense. The glory of God belongs to God and God alone. And the Bible says that he, share, he shares his glory with no one. But the point of the passage is, you, your suffering will cause you to see God in a whole new light. Not only on the life to come, but on this life. You take Job, for example. He suffered as suffering goes. As far as suffering can go, that man felt it. Pain in the body, oh, he had it all. Pain in the emotions, oh, he had it all. Pain in his pocket, oh, he had it all. And how does he conclude his book? Not by complaining, he concludes his book by saying, Before I heard of God, now I see God. So see the reward there? His reward was God himself. And let me tell you this, nobody works without reward. Nobody work. Why are you doing this Bible study right now? Why am I taking my time to do this recording? Why are you taking your time to watch? See, we have been on, we have been together since I prayed for 51 minutes. Why why are you dedicating on this time? Is it because you got nothing better to do? Or some people may be during this quarantine, but usually when they want to kill time, they don't go to a Bible study. They don't watch a Bible study like you are doing right now. So why are you doing that? Because you believe that you're going to have a great reward in learning the Bible. And you believe it right. You will. Let me give you the name of your reward. God. More of God. Now, if you thought that you, it, you would be better off with less of God, you will not be watching this Bible study. Why do you study the Bible? Because you think that you're going to know more of God. And by knowing more of God, you will be happier with more gladness healthier and yes God grants all of those but why do you come to him because he is the reward some people say don't come to God because of his rewards well wait a minute the greatest reward of God is God himself it's God himself so yes come to God because of his rewards and remember his reward is himself he is the reward you want to be happy? Seek for the reward and work hard for it. What is the reward? God. Now, if you think the reward is anything else, uh, th then you have a problem of interpretation, of understanding the Bible. But you come to God because of the reward, which is, he, which is God himself. Let us continue. Um, 
reference 180 in correcting them for their sins so let us read revelation chapter 3 verse 19 as many as i love i rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent now how how does how does he chasten us how does he rebuke how does he uh correct now if you are a father or a mother you, you can you have a great parallel now if you were i'm sure everybody everybody's a child of somebody obviously otherwise it would not exist but if you had the privilege of growing up with your mom and dad or at least one of them um you saw that you were chastised you were corrected you were uh in my case <laughs> many times uh, and that caused me to love my parents way more way more i told my mom many times already she, she's just here with me she's on the room next door no on the next room if she would not have given me all that i got and boy i got a bit boy i got a bit i i had it coming though uh if she would not have done that i would have swallowed her alive because of what she did because of what she did and boy those things were painful I, yeah because of that i love her today because she by doing that she was removing from my body from my brain from my emotions those nasty habits though even the emotions she parents are able to control so jesus does the same with his people how does he govern his invisible church by correcting them from their sins you're being corrected by god if you're suffering under god's discipline understand that you need it understand that you need it I, the other day I was reading of this story of a gentleman that uh, grew up with very strict discipline and he was I, I understand too, that discipline was over the board and uh, was excessive and he said I will never say no to my child whatever my child wants I'll give I'll do all his wishes uh, the child grew turned not into a man but into a <laughs> A devil or something like that uh, was bad the, the story was of course I'm using uh, metaphorical language here obviously but it, it gives the idea and eventually that child a grown man by now hated hated his father and committed suicide church discipline it's necessary but in this case here God's discipline, direct, not the one in, in, mediated by the church, which is also necessary, which is a mark of the true church. But on this case here, he's speaking specifically of the direct intervention by God directly into your heart. No mediator whatsoever. You need that. I need that. Now, here's what we cannot do. We cannot go to people and say, you are suffering this particular affliction because of that other particular sin. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Let me tell you why you cannot do this. Because you don't know. He may be suffering that affliction because of sin B and you're saying it's sin A. So you're a fool. A colossal fool. You don't know. Now, here's what we can affirm. All tragedies sufferings that any anybody on the whole world suffers it's because of sin now which one when adam and eve ate of the forbidden of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that that caused our problems now the more i sin of course the more the more troubles i can expect but look at job for example Holy man, fantastic man. God himself said, <laughs> God said, you see, on the, he, he is the, there's no one on earth that, that's like my servant Job. What a man. <laughs> God said that. Oh, may I live to hear God say that of me. May you live 
to hear God say that of you. And he suffered so much. He suffered so much. And now his his three friends, friends, let me put that into quotation, said, oh, Job, you're suffering because of sin, man. But technically, they're right. We suffer because of sin. But the point that they were trying to make is, you're suffering because of one particular thing that we don't know yet what it is. But you're suffering because of that, Job. Now, let me tell you why this is foolishness. Number one, I mentioned a few minutes ago, you don't know which is a particular case. You're not privy to God's plans. You're not. You're not. Just don't, 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 don't come to me and tell me, oh, God told me. No, 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 he didn't. Okay, he didn't. He didn't. Just, just, just don't. He knows his plans. You don't need to know. Let me tell you why this is also foolishness to try to find out which one. Why does it matter? Let's say that I'm I'm stricken with cancer. Let me let me let me go with that. It's a popular one. Or today, let's say you get you catch the coronavirus. May you never catch it, my brother and my sister. But let's say you do. Uh, and let's say you find out, oh, I'm suffering with this virus because of sin A. So what you're gonna do? You're gonna stop sin A? Well, I hope so, but you know that you have more than sin A, don't you? You have sin A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, L, M, N, O, P, P, R, S, Q, V, L, L. You know you have those sins, don't you? If you don't, then you are in way more trouble. <laughs> you are in way more trouble than what I'm telling you right now. But you know you have multiple sins. So let's say you find out which one. Let's say by a miraculous situation. Let's say God speaks to you. And... uh. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't know why, but the phone stopped recording. But that's actually not so bad because take a look at this. We are over one hour. Uh, so let's let's end our Bible study here. And the last thing I was mentioning when I was rudely interrupted by my own phone is that when when we when we suffer, we have an opportunity. Cess Lewis, I think, was him, said that suffering is God's megaphone to a to a deaf, to a deaf, a deaf word. A word that doesn't listen, a word whose ears are blocked. That's you. That's me. Do not think that's your neighbor. He is also. But think about yourself. So if you're suffering, and the whole world is pretty much suffering right now, quite a bit with this crisis. Whether it's legitimate or not, whether that is it's way too hyped or not, that's not my point. My point is there is suffering, plenty going around. So let us let us think of our own sins. Let us repent from them. Let us turn back to the Lord. We will continue on the next Bible study from where we stopped. And we are we have just concluded reference number one hundred. I'm gonna mark here. You can see me here marking it. Reference number one hundred and eighty. We're going to continue from this one here on the next Bible study. Let us pray. Let us pray and ask the Lord to bless us. Bless us, O Lord, our Father. Bless us, Lord, our God. May we love you more, for you are the King of the kingdom. Without you, there is no kingdom. Without you, there is no salvation. Without you, there is no heaven. So bless us. Bless us, O Lord the glory of your holy name that we may love the king more that we may be more active in his kingdom for the glory of his holy name in Jesus name we pray Amen God bless you